Just having a Saturday morning pipe. This is a uh, custom built. It's one of the later rich era custom builts. Notice the crisp rustication. And just that uh, diamond shank, you know, uh, is not uh, the original stuff. This has a little more, I would call it Italian flair. So, but it does have the rustication, has that nice wide saddle bit. Yeah, I don't know. Whoop, it's uh, one of my favorite shapes, this sort of half bent, uh, billiard bold saddle bit. <laughs> Check, check, check. It could be a little larger. But. So I'm smoking some Peter Heinrichs. Which is this? Uh, Golden Sliced. This comes from... Um, let's see if you can see that. Yeah. From uh, Blue Collar Thug. Thank you very much. Matured Golden Brown Piedmont and Old Belt, Virginia, Long Cut Flake, Light Naturally Sweet Bouquet, made in Germany, from Marengo Cigar, is the U.S. distributor. Sent that to me, very nice. So I'm trying to get it lit here. There's a little moist, actually. A few little diamond matches. Of course, that's why people use lighters. <laughs> do I even have one out here with me? No, I do not. <laughs> so, we'll make it work. I'll tell you what, my standard is still that Peter Stockaby Balkan Supreme. It just... It's okay uh, when you buy it fresh, like from Ivan Reese or somebody like that in Chicago. Or just from Peter Stockaby. Um, they call theirs IRC Balkan Supreme. But give it a year of cellaring, and wow, it is really good. I have discovered that it's it sort of wanes in flavor after I'm with you Doug Owen from Cargo Hold maybe six to eight years a lot of Latakia mixtures seem to be that way they kind of peak out hmm. yeah this is nice um, has some body to it has some complexity to it but it's still smooth. Not super sweet, but it's got a little sweet note to it. It's a little more subtle than the uh, Balkan Supreme. It's nice. So, uh, that's what you get for wearing a white shirt. <laughs> that shows all over the place. So I was listening to uh, PBS this morning while I was... Oh, I, okay, let me step back a minute. One thing I do and have done for 30 years Honest, yeah, thir yeah, 35 years, let's say, um, is I bake pies, all right? I admit it. It violates a man code, okay. But uh, I was hauled in as a emergency stand-in baker for a friend of mine who was running a restaurant in Silverton, Colorado called The French Bakery. 
so a few expectations there. And his his uh, college age uh, baker had jumped ship a week after he started. So whether he imposed some rules that she didn't like, or I don't know. But anyway, he was without a baker at a place called the French Bakery. Now that's serious. So my grandma on my mom's side was a magnificent baker from Nebraska, small town Nebraska. My mom was a great baker, also from small town Nebraska. Uh, and, you know, with my grandma, she'd come out to Denver to visit, and when I was a little kid, she'd say, do you want to bake something with me? And I'd say, uh, because I'd be watching her, you know, make cinnamon rolls or bread or something. And, uh, I said, well, I guess, okay. And she said, well, here's something, it's called a dump cake, and it is just like six ingredients if that and you mix it in the cake pan like a nine by nine cake pan and it bakes there so nothing to clean up <laughs> and it makes like a chocolate cake <laughs> from scratch so uh <laughs> so so that got to be a ritual every time she came we'd make a dump cake right so so from early on, I was, I had that kind of going on. So anyway, my buddy, I think I'd probably told him that. And he said, help me, please. <laughs> I gotta have a baker. This is the French bakery. So he said, it's not hard. They, uh, the way it's done here is you just assemble uh, high quality pre-made stuff and then bake it off there and so I thought well how hard could it be right um, and he was right that's kind of what they did um, it was all really good quality stuff and the result was good but it wasn't really homemade you know and uh, so the trains would come up some, from Durango, the tourist trains, the on the narrow gauge, the former Denver and Rio Grande, up the Animas Canyon, big tourist thing. And there'd be like five or six trains at the peak of summer. Uh, so there'd be like, I don't know, three, 4,000 people in town. Wow. So we would be slammed from like 1030 until four. And then it'd just be like, you know, but that's life in a tourist town. And this was the peak of summer. So after a while, you know, I got pretty good at assembling that stuff and, you know, it got pretty routine. So it being an actual mining town, uh, there were, the waitresses tended to be older gals who their husbands were miners and there was a hard edge to them <laughs> hearts of gold let me tell you but uh, but they had opinions so I said ladies what do people really want you know as far as baked goods and they said well you know what people really like is homemade pie really homemade pie and we made all our own cheesecakes from scratch they were excellent uh, six at a time um, we made well everything else was pretty much assembled so um, so I said okay let's do it let's make some homemade pies so uh, <laughs> so I said, bring me your pie crust recipes, because a pie is totally dependent on its crust, right? So, oh my God, we tried the olive oil, we tried the three drops of ice water, we tried the vodka, we tried the, oh, we tried every single one. Finally, 
one of the waitresses, uh, I'll bet we tried 20 different recipes. Now, it had to be consistent. It had to be easy to work. And almost none of them were. They were all like crumbly and pains in the ass. So, um, consistent, easy to work. They had to be able to be, the recipe had to be times 10. So you could really do volume baking. Uh, and again, being consistent, it had to taste good. You know, some of those pie crust recipes just were like crap. So, so finally one of the waitresses brought in a cookbook that I looked at and I said, really? It was uh, from the Silverton Ladies Auxiliary or something like that, you know, uh, like right out of the 1950s. Um, four can casseroles, um, you know, that kind of kind of stuff. There were some real gems in there too, and one of them was Thelma Zanoni's Perfect Pie Crust, and it was a recipe that used an egg and a little bit of vinegar and darn it if that didn't fill all the requirements it was like wow this just works great and we also used it um, they'd make up a big pot of chicken stew basically and beef stew and then we just fill a soup bowl with the stew and then cover it with a crust and call it a pot pie and sometimes those trains I mean Silverton's at 9300 foot elevation another problem uh, in baking and the humidity is really low you know so uh, people you know it sleet and almost snow some days and pe the poor tourists from <laughs> Texas or Oklahoma or <laughs> wherever would come in just like frozen to death and they just wanted something hot so those pot pies worked really well too and it was all homemade stuff so that was my goal was to uh, to do stuff homemade because honestly I don't I'm not a, a big one on how it looks you know all pretty and all that I really don't care but it has to look homemade. It has to look like grandma made it. And it has to taste great. And it has to perform that way. So the, you know, the little cutouts of all, you know, forget about it. That's just not my, my thing. So I brought my distinctive uh, <laughs> perspective to the uh, baking thing. And it was kind of difficult for me. I mean, yeah, with French pastries, you have to make them look a certain way. But, uh, so the uh, pinnacle of that summer of baking was the governor, the Col uh, governor of Colorado was going to make an appearance. I forget why. And he was going to speak at this restaurant. That was going to be his, his San Juan County stop. And so they were going to have dinner, uh, dinner for, you know, a hundred people and, or m more than that, actually. And so I wanted to do something kind of local Colorado. So Col Western Colorado, uh, like Eastern Washington, is a big fruit growing place and they're very proud of their fruit. And it's kind of, it's a similar climate, actually. Uh, so we got some cholera, a box of Colorado Macintosh apples uh, that were fresh off the tree, and I made 25 uh, Macintosh apple pies. <laughs> that was that was fairly epic. <laughs> so, and the governor came back and said how good it all was, which was fun. So, politicians like that. But uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. So that's a kind of an extended story uh, to talk about why I still bake pies. Because almost nobody bakes pies these days. Homemade pies. 
uh, grandmas have kind of aged out and moms are too busy and kids like want to order it on their smartphones <laughs> you know so so a homemade pie is actually kind of a real treat and so uh, so that has kind of become my thing and so I'll take them into work and uh, do an all staff email and then see how long it lasts you know how many parts of a minute it lasts so uh, it's it's a lot of fun so this morning um, I was at the store the other day and they had the little store I go to uh, a really local store um, at the town down the road often will have uh, fruit or vegetables that are kind of beyond their prime in a bag uh, like you know decent side bag for 99 cents and it, that appeals to my sense of economy so they had plums these really nice big organic plums and apparently people weren't weren't buying the plums and so there's this whole bag must have been 10 pounds I mean it was like, wow a lot of plums and uh, I'll just talk for a while. Um, so I had all these plums and I thought, plum pie, I tried making a plum pie once and it was like, uh, wasn't that good. So uh, there were some honey crisp apples too. And I, I kind of like bacon with honey crisp apples because uh, hardly anybody does. And they actually are kind of a good bacon apple. Uh, they're a little lighter, a little crunchier and they have a nice light flavor. So uh, I've got a, when I was at the restaurant, the French bakery, I bought a uh, made in Vermont apple peeler, core, or slicer. So you stick the apple on the thing and you spin it and it, it just goes through and then peels it and cores it and slices it. It's kind of like, 1910 technology or earlier but uh, it's great and so I still have that so I whipped up those uh, those uh, honey crisp apples and I looked through I have a couple of cookbooks and I thought plum pie what's what's the secret of plum pie so they said um, one recipe was to just some said to peel the plums have you ever tried to peel a plum? It's like, forget about it, you know? And these were all very mature plums, so they were resisting peeling. You'd think they might peel better. Well, they might have, I don't know. But this one recipe said, just slice them in half, get rid of the pit, stick them in your blender and grind them up, because the, there's a lot of flavor and value in the skin. So I thought, well, what the heck? So a couple of them were beyond <laughs> beyond usability but uh, I got about four big plums in the Vitamix you know turned them into puree and uh, then mixed them with the apples and so I baked a couple of pies this morning so last weekend the weekend before was it last weekend I think it was last weekend yeah um, there's a pie contest at our county fair so I've entered that before and, uh, and yeah, I've won, but you know, uh, so this time I made a, uh, peach blueberry apricot pie and I tried it out on my testing crew, which are some friends of mine. One in particular is an 83 year old lady from whom, whose mom I bought my house. And uh, she she will tell me if it's really not that good, <laughs> or she'll criticize. You know, she's she's critical without being too mean. She's really a, a good judge of it too, so so I appreciate her. You know, some of my friends are like, "Oh, it's so good, yeah." Well, you know, I, I need criticism. 
So anyway, um, I'll stick up a picture. Uh, I got first place, so that was, that was fun. And then at 5 p.m., uh, the whisk, local whisker club in Breverton uh, had a contest. I thought, well, this, you know, I didn't shave for the, for the canoe journey, so I got a week start on a little beard thing. And um, I never had one of these. So, and that's always the hardest place to shave. You know, you nick yourself. It's always like a, you miss some, so there's this stubble sticking out. So I thought, I'll just let it grow. Let's see if I got the chops to do something with that, you know. I mean, some guys are just, you know, some of that Slavic blood or whatever. Man, you know, that's a, that's a grade A beard or mustache. I can't compete against that, I'm sorry. But, just to be silly, I entered, and what do you know? I got a trophy. <laughs> Is that funny or what? It's like, uh, let's see if it'll focus on that. It's probably backwards or something. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> so third place, and I'm... I expected to win nothing, nothing. So, anyway, that was a lot of fun. But, uh, yeah, you never know till you try, right? This was fairly damp, this Peter Heinrich stuff. It's good. It's good. But just as a uh, favorite smoke, I think the stock of be Balkan Supreme is still, is still it for me. I have a kind of an unrefined palate, so maybe it's so coarse and like wild in its flavor that uh, I can actually taste it. <laughs> I don't know. So I was grumbling around this morning, my back was killing. And I'd popped a, puppy, a couple ibuprofen and I even put a little CBD salve on, which I resist doing. And it's, it's, it is better now, but uh, God, I, I get it why people uh, who are in chronic pain turn to opioids and stuff. I mean, I'm not going to do that, but um, and it's just... You're just, there's just nothing you can do to fix it, you know. And you're just lying there in agony. So I'm kind of exploring some mindfulness stuff as well uh, to kind of help me with that. But, uh, 